All right, hi guys. Uh, welcome everyone to the Raven Lab Colloquium. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Aaron Walsman. Um, this is what I look like without a mask on. Um, I know it's kind of scandalous. I'm showing a lot of nose in this picture, which I think people are not used to these days. Um, as you can tell by the cat on my shoulder, if you can see that, I am not in charge. Um, not even the cat thinks I'm in charge of anything. Um, this is Panther, by the way. Um, this is my technically the property of my former ex-roommate uh, who has since moved to the Bay Area, so life has been a little bit hard lately because I don't have my kitty anymore. Um, this is Ali Farhadi, who actually is in charge. Um, you can tell he's in charge because he has a nice jacket on and no cat hair on the jacket. Um, in addition to me on Ali, we have several other current grad students, um, a couple of undergrads, uh, several past grad students and postdocs, um, and one past student uh, ex-roommate who has run off with my cat. Um, but I'm not really jealous or anything. I'm, I'm pretty much over it. Um, most normal labs uh, say that their cool research is the intersection of some cool thing and some other cool thing. Um, we started out as no exception to this. Um, our cool things were vision and machine learning. Um, somewhere along the line, though, some people started working in vision and NLP. Um, at some point, AI became ML, or sorry, ML became AI, but ML was still kind of a thing. Um, meanwhile, people were also working in robotics. Uh, robotics and AI had a baby called embodied AI. Um, reasoning is another word Ali wanted me to put in here. Um, and lately, some people have been working in robustness for machine learning as well. Um, so lately, we're starting to feel a little bit less like a research lab and more like we're getting really good at risk. Um, but uh, all of this is to say that we like collaborations and we like working on lots of different things. So if you're interested in anything you see here, um, we'd love to talk to you about it. Um, it's also worth mentioning that most of this expansion has happened through various collaborations here at the Allen School. Um, I'm not going to list all of them, but just uh, off the top of our heads, um, we have a lot of collaborations with uh, Hannah and Yejin in NLP, um, with Dieter in robotics, uh, and recently with Ludwig in uh, machine learning and robustness. Um, we also have a lot of external collaborations. Like many other labs at uh, the University of Washington, we collaborate a lot with the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, um, as well as uh, Apple for some unknown reason. Um, to give you an idea of some of the research that's come out of our lab in the last couple of years, um, we have this project called YOLO, um, which is a very popular um, 2D object detection algorithm. Um, it's one of the first uh, detection algorithms to offer high, high quality for uh, at fast frame rates. Um, we also had uh, this BIDAF paper in NLP, um, which was one of the first um, NLP models to use uh, bidirectional attention uh, and really um, did very well in uh, machine comprehension and question answering. Um, we also have um, this uh, IQA model by um, notorious cat thief Daniel Gordon, um, which was uh, one of the first VQA models to allow an agent to make uh, interactive to answer questions about an interactive environment. Um, and then finally, we also have this recent VCR data set, which has been very popular, um, which combines vision and language. Uh, you ask questions about these images and have to give uh, reasonings for why those answers are correct. Um, kind of belongs some here between vision and NLP, but uh, maybe also reasoning. So I don't know, Venn diagrams are hard. Um, as far as numbers go, we have almost 60,000 citations in the last five years. Um, 76 papers in uh, major conferences and journals, um, 39 repositories on GitHub, uh, one successful startup, Xnor, which was purchased by Apple. Um, and so today we're going to hear from Kohao, Mitchell, Aditya, and then later myself um, about some current work that our lab is doing. Oh, real quick note. Sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, anybody who is on Zoom in the chat, um, I think we're going to take questions between talks, since these are going to be kind of short. Um, unless there's something urgent where you can't hear somebody or something, um, we'll just we'll take those at the end. Uh, I will be monitoring um, questions. Actually, I need to take this laptop for that. I will be monitoring questions on Zoom. Um, you can also just speak them out, and we will be able to hear them here in the auditorium. Um, so yeah, thank you. All right. So hi, this is Guohao, and I'm a uh, Fourth year PhD student working with Ali and Luz Bay from AI2. And today, uh, I would like to introduce our CVPR 2021 paper about interactive visual navigation. This is a joint project with Luca and Luz Bay from AI2. 
and my advisor, uh, Ali, in our department. In this work, we study a problem of interactive visual navigation, where the agent learn to change the environment to navigate more e efficiently to their goal. Yeah, so the traditional indoor navigation task usually only allows the agent to move, like moving forward, turning around, or looking up. This is because this type of task doesn't need any real interactions uh, to the environment. The only thing the agent need to do is just move. However, uh, we are living in a dynamic world. We are uh, able to interact with the object surrounding uh, us. For example, uh, we can turn off this computer, turn off the light, close the curtain, and open this cabinet, or pick out a pen, etc. There are so many, uh, so many jobs really need us to interact with our world. For example, the only way to get a glass of wine is literally putting it from a bottle. As a result, in this project, we take a small step toward this direction. We are trying to let the agent solve the task by really interacting with the environment and change some object state in the environment. Here, we formulate two downstream tasks in AI to solve environment. The first task is, object, is obstacle navigation. In this task, an agent has to reach a goal location while the path to this location is blocked. Is blocked. In this example, the agent needs to push the obstacle out of the way so that it is able to reach the goal location, shown in the yellow circle right there. And the second task is object placement. In this task, the agent needs to move an object to the goal location, shown in the uh, yellow circle, uh, by pushing or pulling it. In this example, the agent has to move the garbage can to the goal location. To solve this task, we propose a neural interaction engine. Assuming that our perceptual model gives us uh, multiple key points of the interest object, the alarm clock uh, in this example. The eight, th this engine aims to predict where the next key points in three-dimensional space after the agent apply different force or apply different actions. Taking the push action as an example, our neural interaction engine is able to predict the next object's key point after the agent applies this push action. More specifically, our neural interaction engine first predicts an affine transformation matrix associated with this push action. Then it's applied a uh, rich body transformation like uh, rotate and translate the observed key points according to this matrix to obtain the action conditional key points result from this uh, push action. Along with uh, this information, our policy network can then utilize all the predicted key points to select an action, a right action to take in the current time step. Then, uh, to benchmark different models and approaches. In this work, we collect two data sets for the uh, obstacle navigation and object placement tasks. Each data set has 15,000 episodes sampled from a 120 things. We have open source all our data already. It's free to use. So on the two quality data sets, we show that the policy with our proposed neural interaction engine solves the task more effectively than several baseline methods done with it. Furthermore, the operation studies in our paper confirm that the proposed uh, neural interaction engine is robust to its predicted loss. Okay, in the following, we, uh, I would like to show two successful examples from our agent uh, on the obstacle navigation and object placement task. Here on the left, we show the image uh, actually observed by our agent. On the right is a top-down view for visual, visualization purpose only. In this example, the agent is trying to move the pen and the computer away so that it is able to reach the goal location showing in the yellow dots. And here is a, uh, an example about object placement, where the agent is trying to move the box to a yellow target. 
And okay, so I, I would like to end by showing a, a failure case on the object placement test. In this example, the agent is trying to move this box to a yellow circle as the other end of the bed. And after many steps trying, the agent just push this box underneath uh, a bed. So let's, uh, the agent can no longer find a box because it's on the, the bed. And the agent just created the episode to avoid this hopeless trajectory. Okay, thanks for joining uh, with me today. Please find our data set environment and code on our project page. It's free to use. Thank you. Uh, Kaylin asks, um, have you tried combining both object placement and navigation tasks into one scenario? For example, if the agent needs to move an object but the path is blocked. Yeah, so our obstacle navigation uh, task is we need to move away the obstacles, but uh, we don't we don't we don't try we didn't try less if we want to move the obstacle to a certain location, but this will be a good uh, very interesting duration. So there's a paper called rearrangement. Uh, in Add to Thor, and they they are trying to move several different objects to a certain location by showing a goal image in the end. So, yeah, it's a very interesting direction to explore. <laughs> Carolina asks, uh, could you expand a bit more on the information of the key points and how they differ from action to action? So the key points is detected by a uh, first we detect. Uh, we, we apply a segmentation model to, uh, to, to obtain a semantic segmentation as each time step from the uh, current observer image. And then use this uh, segmentation, we can apply some heuristic algorithm to obtain the key points. And then for each different actions, we have a module to uh, have a uh, action index so that we know semantic meaning about the different action. And then combine with this action semantic meaning with, and, and the key points as a current time step, we can predict a, a function of metrics corresponding to different actions. And then we apply these metrics to the observed key point to, to predict the next key point uh, for different actions individually. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mitchell, and I'll be presenting our recent work on the robust fine tuning of zero shot models in collaboration with uh, folks at OpenAI, AI2, and uh, Columbia. So we begin by looking at uh, sort of the typical machine learning workflow where you have a model that you want to train uh, and you download your favorite data set from the ImageNet to do so. Okay, so you're now ready to split this data set up, uh, use part of it to train the model and the remainder for testing. Uh, and if things look great and accuracy is high, you, might not, you may now want to uh, deploy your model into the real world. Um, Okay, but the world is a dynamic place and the, the model may encounter uh, data from new environments leading to a substantial performance drop. Uh, and this is a large issue, uh, particularly uh, because reliable machine learning models are critical in applications such as autonomous driving and medical imaging. So accordingly, there's been a lot of work in the recent years trying to understand model behavior under distribution shift. So in this setting, a model is evaluated on not just one, but on a series of related but different distributions. The goal here is to have consistent and high accuracy. So zooming in on one such uh, natural distribution shift, we see that while the popular ImageNet data set consists of images that may have been uploaded uh, to the internet by humans, on the other hand, there's a, an object net data set which contains centered objects and from various viewpoints. Uh, and to really ground the numbers that we saw on the first slide, we see that while the very popular ResNet model gets 76.2% accuracy on ImageNet, the performance on ObjectNet degrades by nearly 40 percentage points. Now, although typical algorithm algorithmic interventions do not help, Substantial progress towards the goal of consistent and high accuracy was made recently by OpenAI's CLIP model. So this uh, OpenAI CLIP model is trained to associate a diverse array of image caption pairs from the internet. 
And OpenAI's clip can perform zero shot inference, which means that it can classify images without any further training on any downstream tasks. So for instance, if we want to know what food this is in this photo, we construct a series of candidate captions, such as a photo of guacamole or a photo of ceviche. And we see which of these captions this model most associates with this image. Here it's correctly uh, predicting the caption which contains the gla class guacamole. Um, okay, so while clip matches the performance uh, of a ResNet on ImageNet, the performance on ObjectNet now drops by only three percentage points or four percentage points, whereas the typical ResNet drops by nearly 40. Now, the authors of CLIP observe similar robustness improvements on a wide variety of natural distribution ships, but there is a lot of room for improvement here. Namely, CLIP matches a ResNet on ImageNet in getting 76% accuracy, but ResNets are models from 2016, and a lot has happened in the past five years. So we're now surpassed 90% accuracy on ImageNet. So let's improve the accuracy of CLIP, but how? Well, usually to improve the accuracy of a model, what we want to do is continue training it or fine tuning it uh, on data from the downstream task. Um, however, when we try to do this, we do see accuracy improvements on the downstream task, but in addition to this, we see a large gap in robustness. So in this work, our aim is to really mitigate this compromise between high accuracy and robustness. To examine these results further, uh, we're gonna use a useful tool for comparing model performance on, dif on different distributions, so a scatter plot. So these kind of plots show accuracy on distribution D on the x-axis and accuracy on distribution D prime on the y-axis. As D prime is often more difficult, we follow traditional nomenclature in referring to D prime as out of distribution or OOD and D as in distribution or ID. A useful reference point here is Y equals X. As any model which falls on this line um, achieves consistent accuracy on these two distributions. And our target is to really be in the upper right hand uh, of this plot, uh, achieving high and consistent accuracy. Now, we know that this is actually a reasonable uh, goal in certain situations for certain distribution shifts because this is actually where humans lie. So with models which are, for instance, trained on distribution D, it's a completely different story. These models lie on a linear trend which is far below the diagonal. On the other hand, zero shot clip models lie above this and lie much closer to the diagonal. But let's zoom in and look at what happens when we fine tune. So when clip is fine tuned on distribution D, accuracy on distribution D improves substantially, but rob robustness decreases. Now, what do we want to do? We want to really get the best of both worlds here. We want to capture good properties about both the zero shot and fine tuned models. Now, how should we do so? Well, we're yet to beat the straightforward method of simply averaging the weights of these two models together. Um, this is referred to as weight space ensembling, which is equivalent to just linearly interpolating between these two models in weight space. Accordingly, we refer to our method here as weight space ensembles for fine tuning or wise FT. We now view a schematic for how wise FT performs with different mixing coefficient, coefficients alpha, which trade off the zero shot and fine tuned weights. We find uh, that this trend is shown here by the pink curve, finding that wise FT improves out of distribution accuracy without any loss in performance in distribution. We now see our results averaged over the five uh, distribution shifts which are studied by CLIP, first on a zoomed out plot, uh, and now zoomed in, demonstrating an improvement of 8.7 percentage points out of distribution without any loss in in-distribution accuracy compared to standard fine-tuning. Now, our discussion so far has focused on uh, ImageNet distribution shifts 
but we observe robustness improvements uh, for a wide variety of data sets. For, uh, for instance, natural distribution shifts, which belong to the WILDS benchmark, um, including uh, a geogra geographic uh, distribution shift in uh, camera trap images where uh, we find YSFT provides uh, over six percentage points improvements out of distribution relative to standard fine tuning. Similarly, for satellite images with a geographic and temporal distribution shift and for uh, reproductions of the popular CIFAR classification data set with a distribution shift. And finally, temporal perturbations uh, in videos. Uh, finally, uh, we found that WISEFT is actually able to improve in distribution accuracy compared to standard fine tuning on a suite of benchmarks which are typically used to measure transfer learning performance. So in summary, robustness to distribution shift is an important goal in machine learning and large scale pre-trained models such as CLIP are in a really good step in this direction. However, Despite accuracy improvements associated with fine tuning, uh, fine tuning significantly helps, uh, decreases robustness. Uh, and we recommend YSFT, which really mitigates this compromise between high accuracy and robustness with no extra compute during fine tuning or inference. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mitchell. Any questions in the chat? Oh, uh, I have a question from Josh Gardner, which says, is there any principled way to choose a good alpha? Um, no, not yet. Uh, this is something that is, we're working on and is sort of an open question right now. But usually alpha 0.5 performs pretty well. All right, so with that, um, Aditya is gonna tell us about LLC, uh, which is the project he's been working on for, or thinking about for a while, but just work, started working on recently. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Hi, uh, I'm Aditya, I'm here to present LLC. We'll be talking about how to learn low dimensional binary codes to rethink multi-class classification. And multi-class classification is the basis of every single machine learning model, be it generative or discriminative, which you're using out there. Uh, this is the work accepted at NeurIPS 21. Uh, and joint work with my colleagues from Raven Lab, UW ML, and my advisors Ali and Sham, and collaborators from Google Research, Pratik Jain. So let's start with the basics of multi-class classification. A multi-class classification tries to answer a multiple choice question among L potential options, and there is only one right answer. So given an image, you take a featureization of it, which is a d-dimensional representation, and you want to answer the question, which class does it belong to? It's very similar to what Mitchell mentioned earlier. You give it a cat uh, candidate set of candidates, and you want to say which it aligns most with. And it turns out, in this case, you want the total probability of all the potential outputs to be summing up to one, because there's only one potential right answer. And you take the maximum probability output and assign it as the class label. So in, in the visualization, we see a dog being featureized into a d-dimensional representation and having a linear classifier on top of it, where you have L outputs trying to predict what is the probability of how much, how probable is it to be a ball versus a tree versus a dog versus a car. And eventually you figure it out to be a dog and you assign a one hot vector of 0, 0, 1, 0 for the prediction. So let's talk about the fundamental costs and trade-offs involved with multi-class classification. And assuming your featureization is constant, the final classifier is what changes depending on the number of samples you have. And it scales linearly with both dimensionality of the representation as well as the number of classes. So it's order D times L. There are classic alternatives to reducing the costs in this case. And the first obvious thing is using a tree-based data structure where your compute costs reduce from a linear dependency on L to logarithmic dependency on L. But the memory still remains order of L. Another way of reducing the costs involved is trying to project the d-dimensional representation into a low-dimensional space, k, and trying to learn a linear classifier on top of the k-dimensional space. Now the dependency changes from order d times l to order k times l, both for memory as well as compute. So these are the two key ideas which we are going to think about and use it to rethink how multi-class classification can be done. The reason why I've been talking about multi-class classification is when you look at 
how the traditional multi-class classification happens is every single class is treated independently and has no correlation whatsoever encoded in its output space. When I say output space, you're trying to say what, what class belong, what the image belongs to in a given class, and whenever you're trying to predict, it doesn't matter if it is belonging to a tree or a car or a ball. Everything is going to be equally likely according to your output space, which is not true in the real world. And from a computational perspective, this is very, very sparse. So my question is, can we do better? It turns out someone thought about this in 1990s, and the solution comes from the classic computer science literature of error correcting codes, and they call it error correcting output codes. So instead of using a single active bit for class, why not use multiple active bits per a given class? So there can be an attribute like is, is, is alive versus is brown, which can be active for multiple of these classes, which can just help you define more tighter structures and tighter output spaces. So here, instead of using five bits for a given class, you can just get away with three. So the problem here is you want to learn what codes you want to assign each and every single class, and once you have the class codes, how do you want to learn the instances? And how do you want to assign the codes to the instances? So these are the two sta stages we want to solve while trying to achieve this. While everything is, looks very nice in theoretical perspectives, in practice, the cost of using these output codes is exorbitant because you either need manual labeling of metadata, like attributes, or annotations like hierarchy coming from something like WordNet. Or in the worst case, what most people did was use a random code book for most of the practical purposes. And when I started working on this project, when I tried to learn these codes from scratch using the standard techniques, it turns out every single code just collapsed to a similar looking code just because it, machine learning algorithm found that to be an easy solution than trying to understand what actually is happening. So, the learning was out of question, and I didn't know what to do. And even when I was able to learn, things were very, very large. So typically, a 1,000 class classification should be solved within 10 bits, but I was using like 60 or 70 bits. So it turns out these te techniques became inaccurate and often not tight, not close to information theoretical limits. So I asked the question, can we learn accurate and tight output codes without using any side information whatsoever? So that's where the observation comes in. Until now, what people were looking at was, uh, for, for class representations, people were trying to look at the centroids of all of the instances that belong to a class. And trying to learn stuff from this way of parameterization is a hard problem. I just flipped the uh, question and said, like, why can't I use the hyperplanes I learned during my linear classification as a representation for your classes itself? And the image you're seeing on the screen right now is a heat map generated by the outer product of all the 2048 dimensional linear classifiers, which correspond to 1,000 classes in ImageNet. So that's a 1,000 by 1,000 heat map where the brighter spots show higher correlation. As we expect, not every single class is equally independent. There are classes which are highly dependent. And it turns out the top half, top quarter structure which you are looking at is all, all mammals which are out there and they have a huge hierarchical correlation among themselves. So this is the insight which I use. I said, let's just use the linear classifiers classification uh, vectors as your class representations. And that's where the LLC method comes in. We now have two phases in this, where first we try to learn the code book for the classes, and then use the code book to train the instance codes. And the idea of code book learning, as I said earlier, because class representations are equivalent to your classifiers, I can just train a k-dimensional load uh, linear classifier. But while I'm doing this, I can make my le linear classifier all take weights of plus and minus one, which are completely binary. So the representation now changes from a real value representation to a binary code. I'll be using this k by l matrix, which is all plus and minus ones, as my final class code book. And in instance codes, I just take all of the featureization I learned from the earlier stage, and I project it into a k-dimensional real space, and I solve a multi-label problem where every single one of these k-dimensions are treated as binary classification problems. And my target output labels come from the class codes I learned in the previous phase. And I just try to regress them, and eventually I end up with the class codes, 
and the instance codes being the same. So that's, that's how we end up with a 20-bit class and instance codes. And on the left side of the slide, you see a heat map which is generated with 20 bits. On the right side, you're looking at 20, 40 dimensional real numbers. It turns out 20 bits are enough for you to distill semantic information pretty much meaningfully to solve things like classification and retrieval. I've been talking about efficiency a lot, but I haven't talked about how I can do this. And if you take an instance code, which we learned in the previous stage, you can literally convert this into an integer with a single pass and do an inverse lookup from the code book in an order one time. So your classification cost change from order L, which is linear dependency in real valued numbers, real valued operations, to order log L in binary operations. That's basically it. You are going to have an extraordinary amount of compute savings while having minimal accuracy loss. We applied this on a bunch, a bunch of applications like multi-class classification on ImageNet, uh, retrieval on large-scale image, image, image retrieval datasets, and a surprising application of auto distribution detection. And it turns out on ImageNet classification, with, with various trade-offs, we are only 3% lower than the baseline, which uses all real numbers. And this is surprising because we are about to be 50 times faster, at least, even if you're not counting the binary operation speedups, which you're going to get over real numbers. And you're just losing close to 2.5%. And if you're going to be much more efficient, if you want to be in order one time, you, you lose about 8%, but you can always use this for high recall applications. What we realized from this is LLC learns accurate, tight, and reliable codebooks, which have been elusive for the last 20 years. The same thing happens for image retrieval, but the special thing about this slide is all the baselines which we saw in image retrieval for hashing and binary code retrieval were trained explicitly for this task, whereas our codes were trained for a classification task and were just transferred to this. So whatever you're seeing right now, whichever is beating every single baseline, is just a byproduct of something we did. And it, were not, it was not meant to do it. So lastly, uh, to conclude, like this is the first method to learn both class and instance code simultaneously. Uh, we show that they're semantically rich. Uh, we don't know how to quantify it yet, but yeah, that's, that's where we are at. It enables classification and retrieval, even representation learning and sublinear costs, both time and memory. Um, and lastly, we are trying to scale this up to a million and a billion scale so that you can use this in real value, uh, real world search systems for high recall classification. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aditya. Any questions from the audience or on chat? So what's the cost of creating the code book? Yeah, that's a good question. So the cost of creating the code book right now is order L, but the thing is you are working in a low dimensional space. So even if it is an order L because the K is going to be 20 instead of 2048, you still get the benefits. And the thing is you can also warm start these code books with pretty much a lot of side information if you want to. Okay. So even if they are a bad code book, you can just still start out with it and like you can train for a couple of epochs and you'll be there. Uh, you can read ablations. We did a bunch of ablations on this and yes, you can do faster code book learning. Yes, it's an order L computation, but you can get away with it in, in some, some ridiculously tricky fashion. Yeah, hi there. I'm, I'm wondering if you have any intuition on how much the, the code books you create and, and the way you do it are driven by the way you set up the eventual classification problem, mm -hmm. and, and particularly the penalties for errors, right? Maybe it's really important to me to distinguish dogs from cats because that's really important to me, you know, or maybe I don't because it's actually reasonable to confuse them, right? And, you know, it seems like the, the way you're doing the, the coding could have these sort of downstream impacts, or the other way, depending how you set up your penalty functions, it could have upstream impacts on what codes you want and how you want to learn those codes. Yes, uh, that's actually a very good question. That's something we thought about a lot. The reason why we haven't done any, any of that sort in this paper is we are trying to revive a field which has been dead for the last six years, and we want to show that this is possible. Yes, we can do weak supervision. We can induce hierarchy, as you're saying, by differentiating penalties. I can, I can have attributes come into picture and say, hey, I don't care much about this attribute. Maybe I care about something else. And you induce an entire tree structure, DAG structure, just based off these things. And the code ne codes need not even be binary. They can be ternary. They can be carry. But we just want to show that these are all learnable. 
And even though they are discrete spaces, we are able to learn everything in a continuous fashion. Great, any last questions? Thank you. Sweet, thank you so much. Uh, hi guys, me again. Um, so today I'm gonna tell you about some new work um, that we've been doing, um, which um, I'm calling at the moment, taking things apart and putting them together again. Um, this is joint work with uh, Murujang, um, Adam, Karthik, uh, Dieter, and Ali. Uh, I just want to specifically highlight the work of Muru Zhang, who's a great uh, undergrad who's been working with us on this project. Um, he's done a lot of the work to uh, make this possible. Um, so the main idea of this project is that humans build things, uh, right? We know this. Um, this is uh, very important to our history and our ability to control the world around us. Um, this particular built thing is the Empire State Building. Uh, it is made of over 62,000 cubic yards of concrete, um, 60 57 tons of steel, uh, 64,000 windows, 120 floors, 67 elevators, and over 10 million individual bricks. Um, as we can see from the previous example, one of the critical skills that make construction possible is the ability to reason about parts and how they fit together. Even though I'm not an expert in construction equipment, I know that this excavator has a scooper part two arm parts, a part where a person sits, some stairs so they can get there, these cool treads that let it run over stuff, uh, an engine that makes the whole thing go. But I wanna make it clear that this is part-based reasoning is not a construction of some recent technology. We've been doing this for thousands of years. So the question is, can we teach AI systems to reason about parts and construction? So what kind of parts should we use to train an agent? What actions can an agent take to manipulate those parts? What does it mean to put the Empire State Building in a data set? And how will we get labels for these things? The answer to all these questions is Lego, um, if you should not be surprising if you read the abstract, um, and also a large uh, group of online Lego fans um, that have been building Lego CAD software uh, for more than 20 years. So to answer each of these questions, what kind of parts are we going to use? We're going to use Lego bricks. Um, what actions can the agent take? Uh, we'll use low-level manip manipulation operations, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes. And what does it mean to put the Empire State Building into a data set? We basically steal other people's Lego models that they put online. Um, and I should also be clear that when I say steal here, I'm kind of joking. Um, really, a lot of this content has been put up with Creative Commons licensing, and that's the data that we use for our data set. So, um, we are very lucky uh, machine learners to have uh, data that is both freely available and also um, generously licensed. Um, and finally, uh, we built a full 3D LEGO simulator so we can render models from any direction and get as many levels as we want. So what kind of data do we actually have in our data set? Um, well, it turns out that every image I've shown you so far um, is, has some correlation to a model in our data set. Uh, here's the actual Empire State Building LEGO model. Um, on the left, you can see the product photo, and on the right, you can see this modeled in our simulator, Legotron. Um, here's the Roman Colosseum. Um, this one has over 9,000 individual prick, bricks. Um, this is the Great Wall of China. This is smaller, but still has over 500 parts that you can individually move and place and uh, look at. Uh, remember our giant excavator? We got that too, the exact same make and model. I cheated, I went back and tried to find a picture of this excavator. Um, it has over 4,000 bricks. And actually, the real model here, I don't have it, but it's super neat. It's got this like remote control thing and motors. You can move it around and, and pick up stuff. It's really cool. Um, we have it simulated here in Legotron 2. You'll notice we are missing this big scoop because it's kind of a custom part, but no one's perfect. Um, we also have a bunch of really fun Star Wars models. We got these big like Star Destroyers, um, the big Millennium Falcon, lots of these things. Um, to put this in numbers, um, we have over 1,700 models corresponding to official LEGO products. So these are all products that someone online said, hey, look, I like this actual LEGO set that was produced. I'm gonna build this again from scratch um, using this CAD software, put it online with Creative Commons licensing, um, and that's, that's what we're using. Um, this data uses over 2,000 distinct brick shapes. If anyone's ever you know, played with LEGOs, you know that there's a lot of little distinct variations with different corners, different edges, different, um, moldings, things like that. Um, we have models that are ranging from less than 10 
to over 9,000 individual bricks, which is uh, like the giant Coliseum we saw. Um, and again, Creative Commons licensing that makes it easy to distribute. Um, I want to briefly talk about the anatomy of a Lego model. This is actually one of my favorites. Um, this is model 2130 Duck. Uh, it has precisely seven bricks in it, uh, much less impressive than the giant Star Destroyer, but, um, but pretty cool for illustration purposes. Um, each brick in each file has a part number. These are just the numbers that are used to, to label the individual shapes that we're looking at. Um, the brick also has a color associated with it, as well as a 3D uh, translation and rotation. Um, but it gets even better than this, because each one of these bricks is also labeled with connection points. So we know where all the little bumps are and where all the little holes are that they can fit into, and so we can reason about a full graphical structure for any given LEGO set. So we know, yeah, what's connected to what, uh, how they fit together. So this is normally the part of the demonstration where I would give a live demo, but unfortunately it doesn't run on OS X, which is what we're running off of here. Um, I'm just going to play this video that shows me manipulating one of these models in uh, the scene instead. But I promise to make it up to you if anybody wants. Um, we can go like just across the street over there and over to my Linux workstation, and I'll show you afterwards if anybody wants to take a field trip. Um, so here you can see uh, the labels of each individual brick in here. Um, we're orbiting around this in 3D. We can see these are the visual representations of the individual connection points for the entire model. And here you can see me dragging and dropping models in the workspace using the mouse uh, to move parts around and uh, simulate manipulating these objects. I should point out that we are not the only uh, kind of part-based data set out there, um, but to my knowledge, this is the most detailed, right? There are other data sets that contain, for example, desks that are broken into drawers and, and legs and things like that. Um, but again, we have models that have thousands of parts um, and uh, to our knowledge, this is kind of the, um, the furthest edge of, of detail in, in any kind of part-based data set. So the question is, what are we doing with this data set? What, what task do we want to kind of achieve with it? Um, and our, the, the answer to that is we're trying to completely understand a LEGO model. So what does it even mean to completely understand a LEGO model? We want to know what are all the bricks in the scene and how are they connected to each other? Uh, but again, given the fact that these, these module, models are really complex uh, and a lot of parts are kind of hidden from view, how are we going to kind of deal with the fact that um, we can't see the entire model from any viewpoint? And the answer is interaction. Um, so our agent is allowed to manipulate the scene, uh, move the camera around, and take apart the models to understand it better. Um, and how do we know if the agent fully understands the scene? Well, the answer is we make it put the scene back together again. So our learning environment is composed of two stages. The first is a disassembly stage, where the agent is allowed to look at the model from any viewpoint um, and take it apart. And then at the end of that, the scene resets, and it has to rebuild that scene from scratch using the memory it gained, the knowledge it gained, the uh, images that it took during the, the first stage. Um, this is just some kind of preliminary work showing, ooh, it's kind of dark on the monitor, um, but this is showing a uh, planner that we're using to generate data. Um, actually going through and building one of these models, moving the camera around, placing individual bricks. You'll notice there's a small, uh, smaller square window over on the lower left. Uh, you can think of this as kind of like a hand workspace where the agent is able to pick up an individual brick. It says, hey, I want a gray two by four. That comes into the hand, and then it uses some drag and drop operation um, to place it into the scene. And you can see where it's placing based on these little red and blue squares that are flashing alternately here. Um, and that's all I've got. Thank you so much. I will take questions. Any questions? Magda asks, Lego models often use the same pieces for very different purposes. For example, the Lego bonsai tree uses pink Lego frogs as, it le as its leaves. Does that throw your approach off? Ah, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, Magda is correct that like there is a ton of variety of bricks, A, but also there's a ton of different ways that individual bricks are used. And some don't have very much semantic meaning, right? A little two by four brick is just a two by four brick and could be anything. But yeah, sometimes there are things like these little frogs or little flowers that are kind of creatively repurposed for lots of different uh, uses. And because we're kind of like working directly from observations, um, this doesn't really throw us off unless um, the agent kind of can't see part of a particular brick. So as long as it can kind of see the entire thing, we're hoping that it will be able to uh, recognize it. Um, but you do bring up a very good point of uh, context, right? How much context are we using um, 
to kind of determine what a part is? Um, will the model kind of learn, uh, hey, what's a frog doing here because it's actually part of a tree? Um, that's kind of an open question. We're, we're still working on a lot of the kind of um, getting a lot of this to work, so we're not quite sure um, what, uh, what the learner will come up with. We have another question online. Sure. So Carolina asks, um, the agent has access to human demonstrations about how to do the assembling or drawings of each step for the assembling procedure. She's asking if. Yeah, so the way we're training it right now, that's a good question, which is like, what's the, what data are we using to train this thing? Um, are we using human demonstrations or something else? At the moment, we're using a planner. So we have a planner that has access to the underlying th uh, physical 3D state of the scene. Um, the planner is able to basically tell you, given one configuration, one set of bricks and their locations, and then another configuration, a different set of bricks and their locations, what actions do I need to take to get from point A to point B? And so using that planner, we generate trajectories, we generate uh, sequences of observations and actions, and then that's what we're using um, at the moment for our training. It's a technique called behavior cloning. Any other questions? Yeah, Andres has another question. Sure. How do you determine the different components that comprise the entire model? For example, for the truck, how, you, how do you determine if it has an arm, driver box, engine, et cetera? Ah, so that's a good question. Um, I, yeah, I kind of pulled a little bit of a bait and switch on you there. And for the truck, I was showing these very kind of like semantic labels of like this is an arm and this is a scooper or whatever. Um, in our case, we're actually not looking at um, semantic components as much as we are actually care about the low-level bricks that are compose, composing them. So we're not really asking the agent to label this is kind of a arm or a scooper or a digger or something. We're just asking the agent to, to label and figure out what are these individual bricks that make up the scene. So we're going a little bit low level than, than my, lower level than my example. Kang has a question. Can the model handle Lego moving parts such as a joint or a gearbox, et cetera? Ah, uh, yeah. This is another great question. Um, and I actually got this the last time I presented this as well. Um, currently at the moment, we do not support um, like moving parts on these Lego uh, models. Um, we're thinking about ways to maybe do this, but uh, it's actually kind of a tricky um, like kind of geometric question. Uh, we don't actually, unfortunately, have labels for these things in the model files, so we don't actually know like where the hinge points are and stuff beyond just seeing you know, this particular type of brick is often used in a hinge, and we see that here. Um, so we don't have a great way of determining um, where those moving parts are other than doing some kind of complex uh, geometric reasoning, which we haven't really attempted yet. But um, we have been thinking about that uh, and how to incorporate that. So what's the reward function Like, what's the yeah, good question. Um, so the question was, what's the objective function? Um, and so there's two ways to think about this. Uh, one is that we're providing it demonstrations. We're saying, OK, you should um, you know, take these actions to rebuild this particular model. And so one objective is just kind of how well does it follow these instructions that have been given. Um, but that's not very satisfying, because there's lots of different ways to build the same model. And so they should all be kind of equivalent. Um, so we actually build a scoring function, um, which is kind of, you can think of it as like how much of the model that it built in the end matches the model that you started with. And it's a little bit complicated because, um, you know, the original model might be here, but the agent kind of builds it over here, like rotated and shifted a little bit. And so like you have to do a little bit of, um, again, geometric reasoning to kind of do some alignment to figure out, okay, like basically what we do is like what's the best alignment between these two models? And then once we perform that alignment, how many bricks in the assembly match the one that are in the target model? So yeah, good question though. Anything else? All right, cool. Well, thanks so much, guys. Um, this has been really fun. Um, we have been collectively the Raven Lab. Uh, and uh, appreciate you guys coming out. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much.